Yo, this is White Label Radio Classic Hip Hop from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. My name is Mellow One, and I have a female legend in the building. Bahamadia from Philly, what up? What's going on? I'm just a legend, though. No, just a legend. You're right. Uh-huh. You're right. Just a real legend. Uh-huh. Just a legend, period. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Legend, period. Yeah. Nice, nice. So what brings you around these parts? The love y'all showing me out here. Okay. You know okay. what I mean? And just... um reconnecting, you know what I mean, doing some interviews, connecting with some old friends, gaining new ones, you know, and um, prepping for my um, box, commemorative box set for my debut album, Collage, which turned 20 April 2nd. Yes, so, yeah. a classic. <laughs> right? A classic. So let's get right into it. Let's, let's, let's talk about, like, your beginning. You know, you're from Philly, mm-hmm. you know, they call it the second city, but, mm-hmm. you know, Philly, Philly hates that term, don't you? Well, I'm, I mean, to be acknowledged on the world music scene, period, at this point in the game, is just is an accomplishment within itself. Okay. You know what I mean? So in terms of, like, the, our culture of hip-hop, traditional hip-hop, um, it is what it is. You know, I've been here since the developing stages of it, so I've been, like, from just a spectator to honing my craft, you know what I mean, to now being a professional recording artist, reaping the benefits of it. Nice. So how was the beginning when you was coming up in Philly and you was actually starting to do your hip hop thing? What was the scene like? And when did you, actually, when did you start? When did you actually start actually spitting your rhyme? Well, I, I first got exposed to hip hop through um, Paul's tapes and the blends and stuff and the cold press tapes in the early the, the formative years, like so towards the early early eighties. Okay. You know what I mean? And then um, the convention albums and stuff like that with all the routines from cold crush and different people on there. And then from there, you know, the park jams where we had rec centers and stuff like that, the dollar parties and that sort of thing in the community. Okay. So it was more celebratory and focused on the regional scenes. And if you had different people, you know, you know, in the summertime coming, you go to different, you go to your auntie's house, you know, in California, you go to your uncle's house down in, down in Atlanta or somewhere like that in the Midwest yeah. or whatever. That's when you got a grip of seeing that during that time period that it was developing all over, it just didn't have a name, you know, and, um, when you came when you came back, you got tapes, so you got a taste of what was going on regionally, and that kind of like came together. You know what I mean? So yeah. it was dope. It was dope. It was real diversified. So who during that time? Who was actually the big names? Because you know, like I know like the park jams and the reg 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 jams. Who was the the DJs and the MCs that was killing it during that time? Remember, in Philly. It, remember everything. Okay, yes, you see in Philly. Philly. Well, the influence was it was a heavy influence in New York though because. You know, the 12 inch, the Enjoy era, whether it's Sugar Hill, all that kind of stuff yeah. was being developed at that time. So we would get the records and, and all the independent 12 inches would come down from Philly. And then we had a radio personality, Lady B, who broke all the, um, the hip hop acts at that time. This video, none of that wasn't even out. Wow. And then we had our version of that, which would be like um, Schooly D, we had Perry P, um, DJ Miz, and Fresh Go. Um, a lot of different people were out. Who else? Wow, a lot of different people. Um, ice cream tea and them was out. Um, then EST and all of them started to come out, but they were different areas. Okay. Jazzy okay. Jeff and all them cash money. Okay. Yeah. yeah people like yeah, that. Yeah. But we reigned probably, and I think people. Um, cool first seeing those dudes, cool right? Cool seeing everybody. Yeah. yeah. They were different areas, but they still were connected because it was a consistent flow of the gradual exposure to our scene. Yeah. You know what I mean? But um, it was. I think it was always referred to as the second city because after New York and the whole tri-state area. They would always break all the acts at our clubs. Okay. And then you know, so Luke and Magic Mike, it wasn't even segregated. You know how like it's different styles of booty shake or whatever trap and all that stuff. Now, yeah. All of that stuff was considered um, hip hop. It was embraced by the hip hop culture because it was everything anti-establishment, everything anti-commercial. Yes. And then the regions took their part that they could relate to best and translated it and developed it into their own thing. Okay. You know, so that's that's how I understand it. So that's why. When I do my projects and stuff like this, or, or through the history of my collaborations and stuff, I always saw this one big palette. I never had um, a separatist mind state. I always represent Philadelphia because that's where I came from. So I, I know I'm a representative there, Napier. You know what I mean? Yes. So I'm showing the world how Philly get down in terms of music and art from a street culture perspective or urban culture perspective. You know? And what was your first? Do you, do you remember your first rhyme that you um, ever spit? 
No, but because you know, I actually I started out as a DJ. Oh, really? Yeah, and I oh, used to write. I, I had a little crew called West Philly Sound Crew. Yeah. And it was this like real big to do um, group called B Force that was in our in my immediate neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And um, he never gave me a shot. So me and a group of friends or whatever, we kind of got our little allowance and all those little things together, did a little bagging at the groceries, you know yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Got a little quick secondhand equipment together, and we started doing like little rec parties and stuff like that. And then um, from there. Um, we went to have like MCs incorporated in because we started having like little regional battles. Yeah. And I always wrote poetry, but they didn't really know it. So I was writing little routines and stuff like that. And the MCs wasn't reliable because we were young. They didn't show up. I knew the <laughs> routine because yeah. I wrote them. And so that's how that came about. But I can't remember all of them. But my first MC name was Tony T. Dove because my real name is Antonia. Oh, so you know. My government name is Antonia. Nice. So you kind of stumbled into actually being the mm -hmm. MC. I stumbled into all of this because I really, um, I really had a desire to be like a producer and like a manager. And I, again, I couldn't find any reliable, you know, consistency within the people that were serious. They might. We were young when we first started out, but uh -huh. I was always serious about the business part. Yeah. Uh, and Nathan. And so I just made myself that situation, and it just snowballed into what it is today. <laughs> and then let's fast forward a little bit. So you started DJing and then you evolved into the MC side of things. Mm -hmm. When did you realize that I got something here and I'm going to actually pursue this MC thing fully and start to really go hard at it? The response of the people, because I had home my, um, when I start when I transitioned from DJ into um, writing as an MC, yeah. um, I had spent time at this um, production company called Burtonist Production. They had Boys and Men, Cool C, um, I mean not Cool C, um, Steady B, um, Will Smith's sister. Ellen and she actually read. Oh, really? She was in the group, yeah. And and then one of her the beatbox that was in the group was like a childhood friend of mine. Well, our families knew each other. She had regional success with rec rec and stuff like that. She's also one of the MCs. K Swiss, she's on three the hard way. Oh, uh, on, on the we we gonna talk about that. That's one of my favorite joints thank ever, you, thank right you. there. That's what, that thank was that was you. ill. That was ill. Thank you. So when all that stuff had came about, um, I hope my skills like the five years or whatever. And then I did um, the regional um, song that I had called Funk Bob that caught the attention of like Guru and the post of other people that led to that. So okay. that's how it happened. And then let's... With the response, but to yeah. answer your question more specifically, the response, the response that I got from my first performance as just a solo artist rapping from being in an environment to learn how to like record and all that kind of stuff, breath control, all that in the studio. Yeah. I had, we had to do like a showcase and I got a positive response and they gave me the courage to just continue doing it. You caught that rush and mm -hmm. that bug and it was yeah. like, I want to do this forever. Mm -hmm. And then I had, I felt like I love DJing and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but I felt like I had more to say. I could say more with the words, you know, cause I was kind of shy and stuff back then too. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So then let's, so it's 20 years for collage. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to still be relevant 20 years later and did you know you had something special when you started to make it? You're never not relevant. It's about you um, being able to translate your perspective in a palatable way during the, at the time that's current. Yeah. And I think a lot of people make that mistake because the more you try to pay attention to being, to trying to equate or validate yourself against somebody else is the moment that you start losing focus on who you are and you can get lost in that kind of energy. So for me, I'm always evolving, I'm always growing, and I always try to keep myself humble by having people around me in my media circle of influence that remind me to just stay mm -hmm. focused on being the best me ever. You know, so if I'm focusing on myself, then anything that I have to say is gonna be viable because I'm giving you my perspective, because that's all we do professionally. Yeah. You know, as artists or whatever, like artists is, is the art is the expression of life, so you just, all you're doing right now, or whoever else is there, you, if, if you're um, a journalist, if you do the blogs or whatever, you know what I mean, behind the scenes or in front of the camera, all you're doing is giving your interpretation of what, how you, how the world impacts you. And all of us see that uniquely different. That's why it's important to be who you are instead of trying to emulate somebody else's energy or experience. That's real. Mm -hmm. That's real. So, when you was, did you know you had something special with collage when you first started to put it down? Well, I always thought that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, it, that was factory equipment because um, just coming up, I always was encouraged to be an individual. And I had a strong example, strong women. And my parent, I knew my mother and my father were married. And, you know, parents were married, all that kind of stuff. So I came out of that kind of structure where it was a little bit more stability than normal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. For our community, at least. And so, um, I always had a strong sense of self, so if I hadn't become a professional recording artist, I was still going to be great because that's, that's the correct equipment that was, what was cultivated in me. I, ne I never 
like I've never experienced or imagined me doing something that I couldn't do. It's, it's just a matter of finding the best method of reaching that goal. And that's, that's just who I am, you know? Yes, yes. That's dope, that's dope. Mm -hmm. So making an album, mm -hmm. what was the process like making an album? It was fun and um, it was a little less strenuous than probably normal. Uh -huh. And I'm gonna say normal compared to me talking to other like people that I know that's professional or they're beginning stages or seeing interviews and stuff yes. on YouTube or whatever. Um, um, well, when I when I hooked up with Gangstar, that was a whole mind blowing experience because I was always the fan of their music. Yeah. So to you know how like you go from the station, you you doing your show and stuff. Before you got to that point, I'm sure if you listen to the Wake Up Show or any other you know groups or tra especially traditional hip hop you know preservers of our culture. Yeah. You don't really fathom yourself being a rival or someday you shaking hands and rubbing elbows with these people. Yeah, you're right. And, and it happens so yeah. great. It happens gradually over time you know next thing you know you sitting in the chair you interviewing your favorite artist like it's just ill in that way you know so i didn't really i hadn't really reflected on it because it was happening in real time yeah. you know that's like being a part of history you don't know you're doing something historical until years down the thing you realize you did something great so yeah. i had to attribute that to the creator i can't say there was anything i just showed up and did what i did so that was a blessing you in the perfect opportunity and yeah. you took advantage of it yeah but more specifically like with google and everything gave me the freedom to do whatever I needed to do. Premiere was very instrumental in showing me like the, some of the fundamentals, you know, tips of what to do and what not to do in terms of the business part. You know what I mean? Yeah. One, one thing in particular, like you always was like, you know, this is your create, you know, this is your project. They paying you to express yourself. So don't compromise yourself and don't let nobody rush you into doing what you you put out, put it out when you turn it in, when you feel like you are ready and, and best represents who you are. And those are the two things that always stuck with me and with Google was always, you know, just be who you are, like who you are is enough, you know what I mean? And just give it your all, you know, he let me do whatever I wanted to do creatively. That's dope. How that did you meet dope. Guru and Gangstar? Was it through the regular label? No, I met him, this crazy, I met him because my sister went to school with the college with a girl that was, cousin was dating him and seeing him <laughs> at the time. And I found out through the grapevine in the yeah. streets. And I had my single at the time and I was like, I gotta get this to the next level, you yeah, know, because yeah. why it's popping. So, um, and I found when I my sister casually talking and telling me, I was like, well, we gotta get to her to get to her. Get. And we got to her to get to her to get to her. She gave him the tape and he liked it. And it just was on. And then they were coming to Philly. They had a show in one of the clubs in Philly that was close to my neighborhood. Because uh -huh. I grew up in University City in between like Drexel and University of Penn. So it was a lot of venues and stuff around the area. He keep they was coming to the shade of the show that night. And um, he said, meet me, me there, you know how his voice is or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Because we had changed numbers and got contacts and all that at that time. And I met him there and then and we just started talking and it just clicked. Next thing you know, I'm in New York recording Total Rap. Next thing you know, I'm doing the video. Then I'm in the studio at D&D &D doing all this stuff. Rubbing elbows with the greats. That's crazy. What was the energy like D and D? I talked to a lot of people that was that I talked to Premier and I talked to everybody was at D and D, mm -hmm. and they said it was like this energy and this spirit at D and D. What mm -hmm. was it like for you? It was the same. It was like it was like um, a hug for encouragement. It was definitely pure hip hop from a traditional sense. Like you know, I mean, this is this one scenario I remember. I'm going. I had a session. I'm going in the session. LL, I'm waiting to get on the elevator. The elevator opened up, LL walking off. And I come up, but when I come, I'm coming to the studio, Big L outside smoking a cigarette. Then you go upstairs, Beat Miners in one room, then you got Biggie and, and C's and somebody in another room. Wow. You got, the, uh, what's this, Buck Wild in the room, mixing, Eddie Sanchez <laughs> doing it's just, But you know, you don't know, you you just in it because you come doing what you're doing. You not, it ain't even doing, I think, I think if I had, it had dawned on me that I was doing it, I probably would have been nervous and, and not Because you're a shy person or whatever, yeah. yeah. Or, or just, the, just the shock of it all, like the love, the standard. You heard the names and these yes. people already had records. I, I was new coming in doing something internationally. Yes. But they was they was new to you know what new to them. So I'm like, oh and this and it was like, oh, ski beats. I mean one time we were on working on a no, we were working on spontaneity. I mean not spontaneity, um the remix to You Know How We Do, the Ski Beats had did that. Yes. And um the girl that's on it, her name is Janae, her name is MC Payne, but that was Freeways. Freeway was in a group called Lost Souls before wow. that. You Freeway been around, you can the same neighborhood. And um, and then he was in a group. It was him and the, and the girl Payne and this guy named Destro who wound up producing for Usher and all this stuff down the thing. But um, 
we in the studio doing a remix that day, and he and Ski and me are playing beats and cymbal and stuff on the side for um for Camp Low for a blue cheese. Wow. You know, this is the and this just was the time that it was going on. So you know, it's something that you can't plan. I can't pretend like I knew it was all this stuff. No, I don't even know. I just was at the right place. You just fell right into it. Fell right right in there. Fell right into it. Yeah. And then from near, from near after that, went straight. My first tour that I ever did in my whole entire life rapping or whatever was when Fuji made so had the score and sold to ten million. So imagine coming from the rec center, wow. your bedroom deck, straight out there. Wow. So you was performing in front of fifteen thousand every no, night. No, no, no. Fifty, seventy fifty seventy oh, wow. five thousand. You know. Wow. They, cause remember they sold ten million. Yes, they did. They you did. know and how was that experience? It was crazy. So you talk about too shy. You you you, you never you yeah. never you never felt that when you was in front of those many people are in that studio or you, you don't have time to think and then your ego because you're around people that you respect and you don't want to be the one out of everybody on the bill that was the loose <laughs> so your ego will make you do the weak you link like, i got time to be scared yeah, now because yeah, yeah. they looking at me yeah. you know <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, but it's more you know what i found that the odd thing though the intimate situations was the most challenging because if you in front of a massive crowd you don't see nobody eye to eye but if you in a small intimate um like venue or whatever the closeness of the people because you you catch one person in the eye and they look in a certain way or they like yo the ride out you think you're not doing well it, 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 it throw you off huh it used to but now I, i'm like if i don't clear the room i'm doing my job because some people i became aware that a lot of people come to hear my lyricism so it's not that they not um participating and coming to party they came to hear and be edified yes you know so yes. i know that so i know i don't have to worry about that and plus you know like i said if you don't clear the room and you're doing something right yeah <laughs> <laughs> if it's one person standing in it then you okay okay you okay yeah so you know you, you mentioned lyricists mm -hmm. was that constantly when you got in the game and you started to evolve as an mc lyrics started to be kind of like when you came up lyrics was like the the main thing was it was it a conscious effort to focus on lyrics and I had to be a raw MC, not like you said earlier, not a female MC, but just a raw MC in general. Well, that was the standard that was set because remember I was introduced to, I told you I was there when the form of the year when it, everything was developing. Yes. I was a young buck, but I still remember. So hearing like shock from, from the Shy Rocks to the Kumo D to the Grandmaster Casses and stuff, that was what I gravitated towards innately. But then down the line when the Gurus and, and the uh, Feral Machas or whoever came out, and we can talk about like Freestyle Fellowship, all them people in between. Yeah. This, these are the people that, that's the standard that I uh, adhere to because that's what.